Hi, this is Imad Al Alim, Middle East Medical Information Center and Directory Biomed Researches and Epilepsy Awareness Program founder and publisher. I do welcome you to the first episode of Understanding EEG Part 1. In this episode, we will concentrate more on the physiological side of the human body. We will learn more how the EEG signal, the acquired one during the test, is generated, mechanized, and what are the organs, parts of the human body which is responsible for it. So let us start the presentation. Brain waves usually recorded from the scalp proves that human beings never switch off their minds. There are three levels of arousals, sleeping, relaxing, and action. All have a characteristic brain waves pattern. The machine used to record these activities is called electroencephalograph or EEG. And this is a sample of modern EEG machine. A small brief of the history or a short brief of the history of EEG tells us that the first, I mean, captured and recorded brain waves were in dogs in 1912. Then a German psychologist and psychiatrist called Hans Berger began his studies of the human EEG in 1920. He gave the device its name and sometimes credited with inventing the EEG. Before we go further and talk more about EEG, I will concentrate, as I said earlier, on the parts and organs on the physiological side of the human body which is responsible for generating the EEG signal which we do acquire during the EEG test. So firstly, let us talk about the nervous system. The nervous system is the most complex system of the human body and this is a sample, this is a shape of the human nervous system and it's considered as a functional component. Every movement of the day, our nervous system will be active and it provides the availability and it provides the ability to perceive, understand, and react to environmental events. That's why the nervous system is so extremely important for human behavior. It's, as shown here, it exchanges millions of signals corresponding with feeling, thoughts, actions, and related to the different parts of the body. The human brain itself consists of at least 10 billion nerve cells or neurons, plus supporting cells. Neurons are able to respond to stimuli such as touch, sound, light, and so on, conduct impulses, and communicate with each other. And with other types of cells, such as muscle cells, it's also responsible for controlling all the biological processes and movement in the body. And can also receive information and interpret it via electrical signal, which are used in the nervous system. The nervous system is organized into three basic functional and structural categories, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system. It uses two different kinds of cells. One is called the jelly cells, which help to support and maintain the other cells, which are the neurons. It's the diamond of the nervous system itself. The neurons on the nervous system usually in the brain side are the multipolar neurons. How did we decide that it's a multipolar neurons? Because it contains dendrites, which has many dendrites inside it, as well as the axon. So it's called multipolar neuron. The nervous system is based on neurons, which are cells used to transmit the signal from one part of the body to another. Here, the components and segments, parts of the neuron. This is the dendrite. This is, as I said, the dendrite, which is hairy-like structure surrounding the cell body, which conduct incoming signal. And all of these are dendrites. This is the nucleus. And this is the body cell, or called soma. This is the point where the soma and the axon meet, and it's called axon hillock. So axon hillock is the point where the soma connects to the axon. These are points of Ramvir, and points of Ramvir are the little spaces between the melon sheath
these are the shown cells as indicated here and shown cells are making up the myelin sheath it wraps itself around the axon as we can see here forming the myelin shown cells are filled with fat called myelin and each shown cell wraps itself around and forms the sheath of myelin which is a kind of fat which speeds up the transmission of electrical signal around the axon which allows the impulse to travel efficiently on the axon and here we have the synapses which is the connection between the neuron and the target cell here we have the axon terminal terminal synaptic bulbs this is an example of another cell which is connected to the cell through the synapses as indicated here so if we go back and review what just we have learned we have the dendrites which are the neuron receiving side and it's considered as the collecting fibers axon this is our axon is like the tail of the neuron and it ends with an axon terminal sending out fibers we have the axon hillock this is the point where soma and axon meet we have the nodes of Ramvir it's the little spaces between the myelin sheath we have the myelin sheath which is formed of Schwann cells we have the axon terminal synaptic bulbs we have the synapses this is the basic components of the neuron so now let us know how the signal is received on the neuron and then transmitted to another cell an action potential usually or a nerve cell signal calls on the dendrites so if we assume that there is another cell here this cell calls on the dendrites for a, and it asks us to transfer a signal the dendrites accept the signal and then the cell body decides to transmit the signal so the signal is received on the dendrites the cell body decides to transmit the signal and the active action potential travels along the membranes it jumps along these membranes when they reach the end of the axon which is called terminal axon terminal then it has to use another means of communication to send its signal to the next cell so I mean once the action potential is received on these dendrites or uh, the, the nerve signal is received in these dendrites and then the body of the cell decides to transmit it which goes from here up to it reaches uh, the axon terminal in order to be accepted or taken by the adjacent cell or the neighboring cell the neuron has to use another method of communication different from the method of action potential where the signal originally was transmitted and because the neurons does not share the membrane with a neighboring cell that's why it cannot use the action potential communication method the neuron uses another form of communication with the next cell called neurotransmitter communications where a chemical signal is merged with the other cell membrane dumping the chemical out on the receiving neuron side it has receptor proteins that have the right shape to fit the particular neurotransmitter so a fast review on what uh, we have just described or what we have explained just now let us take it this way this is our nervous cell this is a, a nerve cell or neuron it has got some dendrites these dendrites receive a signal from a neighboring cell it send it to the body of the cell the body of the cell accept the signal then ask the action potential to travel along with the axon and in order for the signal to travel smoothly in the axon it is uh, isolated with uh, isolation called uh, uh, myelin sheath it's just uh, it's such a fatty uh, cells which allows an efficient transmission of the signal when the signal reaches the axon terminal it cannot go to the neighboring signal or sorry it cannot go to the neighboring cell using the same method of action potential 
because it can't share its membrane with other cells. So in this case, the neuron uses another method, which is called a neurotransmitter. In the neurotransmitter, we will have uh, the signal, the a chemical signal merged with the other cell membrane, dumping the chemical out. On the receiving neuron side, it has receptor proteins that have the right shape to fit the particular neurotransmitter. So now, and since we understood the basic concept of transmission of signal neurons in the nervous system, let us move on straight to the brain where we will acquire our EEG data. The human brain is such an amazing part. It's the most essential part in the body. The adult human brain weights usually an average of about 1.5 kilograms. With this. the brain nerve cells are known as neurons, which makes the organ so-called gray matter. This is three different pictures, graphs of brain. Here we can see the areas of the brain lobes of the brain, hemisphere of the brain, the right and left hemisphere, which we will learn in details in the next slide. The brain has many parts, each of which is responsible for particular functions. The main players in the brain are two cerebral hemispheres, and each of and both of them, they count 80%, 85% of the brain's weight the billions of neurons in the two hemispheres are connected to thick bundles of nerve cell fibers called the cerebral hemispheres. Scientists now think that the two hemispheres differ not so much in what they do, but in the process they do. The left hemisphere appears to focus on details such as recognizing a particular face in a crowd. So this is the left hemisphere and this is our right hemisphere. It focuses, the right hemisphere focuses on broad background such as understanding the relative position of objects in a space. The cerebral hemisphere itself have an outer layer called the cerebral cortex. This is where the brain processes sensory information received from the outside world, controls voluntary movement, and regulates cognitive functions such as thinking, learning, speaking, remembering, and making decisions. The hemispheres themselves has four lobes. The hemispheres have four lobes. Each of them has a different role to play. We have here the frontal lobe, which is mostly for the planning, and it controls executive functions, activities like thinking, organizing, organizing pl planning, and problem solving, as well as memory, attention, and movement. We have the parietal lobe, which sits behind the frontal lobe. This is our parietal lobe and this is our frontal lobe. So the parietal lobe sit, sits behind the frontal lobe. It deals with the perception and integration of stimuli from the senses. We have the occipital lobe. This is our occipital lobe, which is at the back of the brain. And it is concerned mostly with vision. And finally, we have our temporal lobe, which runs along both sides of the head this is our temporal lobe and which runs along the side of the brain under the frontal and parietal lobes parietal lobes deals with the senses of smell taste and sound and the formation and storage of memories so let us just review it back this is our frontal lobe and it's on on the front and it's always abbrevi abbreviated with f alphabet this is our parietal lobe and it comes at the, at the back of the frontal lobe or it's behind the frontal lobe uh, and it's responsible for movement, the frontal lobe for planning. This is our occipital lobe which is responsible for vision and this is our temporal lobe which is uh, mostly in language or which run, run, runs along the side of the brain and the frontal parietal lobe deals with the senses of smell, taste and sound and the formation and storage of memories. This is our cerebrum coordinate movement this is the one this is our brainstem 
So these are the, the basic, I mean, uh, lobes of the brain or the main important lobes of the brain described in basic just to make us understand how the EEG is acquired and once we start learning the EEG, we will know when we talk about the frontal lobe, what is the frontal lobe, we will know about the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe or the occipital lobe and we will know about the potential difference and what is the meaning of potential difference.